Hey folks, uh, welcome back. I am excited to host a- another Forever Employable Stories episode, this time with uh, a relatively new f- friend of mine, Nir Eyal, uh, author and consultant. Nir, welcome to the Forever Employable Stories uh, accidental video podcast. <laughs> Thank you. It's great to be here. Appreciate you having me. I'm thrilled. I say accidental because I never, I never set out to to create a podcast or any kind of podcasty type thing. But it turns out that these series of stories that I've been putting out there uh, kind of qualify as a podcast. So, um, in any case, like but one of the things that that uh, I love about these stories is that. W- I've been looking for people from a diverse set of backgrounds and really looking for different things about them. So t- tell us a little bit about yourself and your career, you know, kind of how, and, and kind of how you got to where you are today. Sure. So I'm what you call a behavioral designer. So I help companies design the kind of products and services that uh, build healthy habits in people's lives. Uh, and the way I came to do this is uh, I spent two companies, Uh, The first was in the solar energy business, and then I sold that, went to business school at Stanford, and while at Stanford, started a company in the uh, advertising and gaming space back in 2007, uh, back when apps didn't mean, you know, apps on your phone, because there was no such thing as an Apple App Store back then. Uh, Apps meant Facebook apps. And uh, we, we, we had this really great vantage point in this new company to see the rise of many of these world-changing businesses like Facebook and Google and Instagram and WhatsApp and Slack and Snapchat, you know, being in Silicon Valley at that time was an amazing opportunity. And many of these companies were my clients uh, at my, my second company. And uh, when that company um, uh, was acquired, I, I had an opportunity to, to kind of sit down and ask myself what I wanted to do next. And I had this hypothesis that the future of companies that would really matter uh, in the world would be the ones that were able to build habits because I could see that as the interface that we interact with technology shrinks as it went from desktops to laptops to mobile devices to now wearable devices and now even more recently uh, auditory devices like the Amazon Alexa and um, uh, uh, Microsoft Cortana or uh, Siri that now uh, the interface has, sh- has disappeared, yeah. <laughs> right? And yeah. so what, what I saw happening is that the visual interface as it got smaller and smaller left, left less room for what we call external triggers for the pings, the dings, the rings, the notifications, which meant of course that if you didn't build a habit with consumers, then your product might as well not exist, right? If you're not on the home screen, if you're not uh, top of mind, then your product won't exist. And so what I wanted to do was to figure out how do you build a habit forming product? Uh, And so I coalesced the lessons of what I picked up from uh, from these companies that I've worked with, like, you know, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, these companies that that I was, I saw the rise of. I had many friends who worked at those companies as well. And um, the idea behind this was not only to figure out for myself what business I wanted to start next, thinking I would start another tech company, but uh, more so, I started publishing what I was learning. I just started blogging about it. Mm-hmm. And uh, the idea was to kind of democratize these secrets, the psychology of what is it about Facebook and the gaming companies and uh, Instagram and Slack. And uh, you know, what is it about these, these tech products that make them so habit forming, so engaging? Well, I, I started blogging about it, and uh, after about two years of just, you know, casually, just for fun, uh, blogging about this kind of stuff and kind of finding my way, and then I started getting some, some consulting engagements. People wanted me to, to help them build habit-forming products, and then a few years into it, I got a phone call from a professor of mine at Stanford, and he said, I really like your model. I really like the research you've done. You put a lot of thought into it. What do you think about teaching a class together? Mm-hmm. I thought, great, that sounds terrific. And so uh, I, uh, he gave, kind of gave me carte blanche to design a class at the Graduate School of Business. And uh, I taught there for a few years. And then I moved over to the design school at Stanford, the, the Hospital Flatner Institute of Design, where I taught for many years. And uh, that then became my book, my first book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, which I originally self-published. Um, I was thinking, you know, I had maybe like 5,000 blog subscribers at the time. 
And uh, they kept emailing me and saying, you know, can you put your blog post into a book? Uh, okay, sure. So I, uh, I, I, I thought it would just be like a 15 page PDF that I'd give out for free. Well, it turned into a 150 page PDF and uh, I decided to put it out on KDP and uh, hit, you know, publish and sold a few copies. And then one day I got a call uh, from uh, an agent uh, and said, look, your book is really interesting. I'm getting some, some people that I think would be very interested in publishing it. What do you, what do you think about selling it? And I said, sure, that sounds interesting. What, what, yep. what can you do? And, uh, she had a pretty easy time of selling it because at that point it had received 500, uh, I'm sorry, it received a hundred five-star reviews on right. Amazon. And, uh, that's kind of the tipping point where people start looking at a book and say, oh, hundred five-star reviews and it's self-published. Huh? That's interesting. And so I didn't have to really sell the book. It was bought. Um, and uh, so we were off to the races. We, uh, it was a portfolio, which is a division of Random House, ended up publishing it. And uh, the book has sold a quarter million copies in the past six years. And it's used in every industry you can imagine from uh, healthcare to, uh, uh, to uh, education companies uh, to all sorts of different businesses use the hook model to build healthy habits in users' lives, to get people hooked to good habits as opposed to just frivolous habits, uh, you know, to exercise more, to eat right, to, uh, to learn a new language, for example. This is some of the applications of the hook model. And so, yeah, so that was my first book. And then that kind of launched my, my um, speaking career, which I didn't really anticipate, but turned out <laughs> to be a, a very fun way to, to make a living. And then uh, more, more recently, just last year, late last year, I published my second book called Indistractable, right. which if Hooked was about how to build good habits, Indistractable is about how to break bad habits because I understand both sides, right? I understand the Achilles heel of what makes these technologies so habit forming. So I really wanted to write a book to help me solve my own problem of how often I, I felt distracted in my life. And so that book was just published in September and uh, it was a bestseller. It's already outselling Hooked. And uh, uh, yeah, so that's, that's my life. Is that, is that kind of cover it? <laughs> it does, it does. It's amazing. It's a really good story too, because it really, it really in many ways exemplifies a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about in Forever Employable. I want to dig, I want to kind of, kind of go back in time just a little bit through the story. And I want to dig into just a couple of the specific details that you mentioned here. So for my first, my first clarifying question is, um, you said you just started blogging casually about your experiences from the lessons, you know, from building your companies and seeing what Facebook and Twitter and Instagram were doing. Um, uh, was this on, on, on your own blog? Where, where were you blogging? I was blogging at Blogger uh, or, or with the, through that, that, that platform, which I don't even know if people use it anymore, but at the time it was the easiest way to, to start blogging. You just use blogger.com, you built a little website, um, today, there are even easier tools like Medium wasn't around at the time, but now Medium is even an easier way to start a, a blog. Um, but uh, Blogger was, you know, just kind of off the shelf service that you could start using. Yeah, that's interesting. And so at any point, like you're building this, and one of the things that, that, that I've done in, in my career, I've used Medium, I've used, uh, you know, other, other platforms, but ultimately, you know, you're the product on those platforms and at any point they can kind of close that off from you and then your channel's gone at that point. Was there any point where you decided, you know what, I've got to take my content and bring it in house under, under your own brand? Yeah. So, and this is my first piece of advice for someone who says, Hey, I want to write a book. What should I do? How do I, uh, you know, it's funny. A lot of people call me uh, for advice around book publishing or, and they say, you know, how did, how did you sell so many copies as if you can, you know, shove crap down people's throats. So, you know, the first answer is write a book people want to read, right? <laughs> like write something useful. Um, but, but the, the second part is to make sure that you find people who like what you do. And so uh, one of the best decisions I ever made was to give people the opportunity to hear from me in the future. And so that's how I built this audience over the past, uh, what has it been like eight years or so now, um, you know, slow and steady, uh, kind of built this email list to about a hundred thousand people now. And so today, you know, I don't, I don't sell anything. It's not very aggressive. There's nothing to, to, to do in, on my website other than 
you know, if you want to hear more, uh, more from me, I publish every two weeks. If you want to see my next article, uh, if you submit your email in this box, I'll send you my articles. That's it. And um, I also do like a weekly uh, uh, email digest, uh, sorry, a um, uh, newsletter digest of articles I've read that I found interesting. And maybe they, you know, my readers would find them interesting too. And yeah. so slow and steady that grew my email list to about 100,000 email subscribers. And that is my first piece of advice to anyone who wants to build an audience is uh, social media and medium and everything else out there is the icing on the cake. It's not the cake. The cake is the, the audience you own, not the audience you rent. Yeah. If you are publishing, you know, if you tweet or you post on Facebook or you know, any, any platform, they own the habit. You yes. want to get people to the habit of engaging with you directly. And the best way to do that is through email for an author. And, and, and today that's become such gospel that today, you know, to go into a publisher and say, hey, I have the most amazing book. What do you think? Uh, the, it's, it's hard to get a meeting. It's hard to get their interest if you don't have an audience uh, because they know that, you know, an, uh, having a big email list doesn't guarantee success, but not having a big email list is a high predictor of failure. Right. There are tons and tons of great books that people spent years writing that nobody ever reads because the author didn't have an audience. And yeah. you know, you, that used to be okay because you went to the publisher and the publisher said, well, if you want to get your book onto a bookstore shelf, you have to go through us. Yeah. But that's not the case anymore. 90% of my books are sold through Amazon. So I, I you know, the, the, the publisher doesn't, can't sit back and, or the author can't sit back and say, oh, the publisher will sell books for me. No, it doesn't work that way. You as the author have to sell those books. And the way you do that is by finding people who want to read what you have to write. Yeah. It reminds me, um, I used to be a broke touring musician for a bunch of years uh, through college and after college. And, you know, you, we were trying to get record deals when, when that mattered. Right. So that's, you know, uh, when, when you get signed with a record label and, um, you know, it's kind of, it was a very similar thing. You know, the bands that successfully sold 10, 15, 20, 30,000 CDs out of the back of their car, right? At the back of their bus or their van or whatever it is, they were the ones who got record deals because they had proven traction with an audience. They had an audience built in. They had successfully sold their product already without any assistance that, that the record labels could just see sort of amplifying that rather than having to create that spark underneath people. Um, so that's, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned eight years and that's the other, that's the other bit of detail I want to dig, dig into here because one of the things that, again, that I, I talk about in the book is you start to build your audience and you start to become this magnet for opportunities. And clearly that's what you've done here. And as you've been telling your story, uh, I think it's become, and we'll dig into it a little bit more in just a second here as well, but I want to talk about timeline here, right? So timeline, like, give me a sense of, of kind of, how long between each of these milestones? So you you sell uh, you sell your second company and you start blogging, right? And you said after two years of casual blogging, right? So you're, you're just sort of writing for two years. Then then you've already talked about what happened. I just want to get a sense of like how long it took, mm -hmm. basically, from when you started blogging to uh, publish self publishing the, the hooked and then getting that picked up. Yeah. So let's see. So 2012, no, sorry. Yeah. 2012, uh, we sold the company that I was, I, I helped found. And uh, I had learned a lot of this uh, from working in that company. So that, that's something that I think is a little bit underrated as well that, you know, I talked to quite a few authors uh, who say, I really want to write a book, but don't have very much interesting, very, very many interesting things to say because they haven't been immersed in uh, a field that gives them any kind of authority or more importantly, not even authority, that's the wrong word, insight, right? It was because I was in the right place at the right time that I had uh, the right, that I knew to ask the right questions. Not even that I knew the answers because I think what drives me as an author is the, the, the curiosity of answering my own question but I knew what the right questions were by being in that industry at that right time and place. Now, that might not necessarily be something that, um, that is a barrier. You don't necessarily have to necessarily have, you know, have a special life experience to, to be a writer, uh, but you do have to immerse yourself in, in, in the 
in the ideas that have already been shared so that you, you, you can talk with some kind of, of insight, uh, really. And so, um, so I would say that, that, you know, that started uh, previously before 2012. From 2008 to 2012, I was at my last company. And then from 2012, we published uh, Hooked in 2014. So about two years of, of blogging and teaching, et cetera. And you know, the, the nice thing is about the, the age we live in, because the internet gives us access to so much information, right? It's all here in our fingertips, um, that you can, you can become a world expert at things that nobody else is really a world expert in, especially if it's a, a, a new field like habit forming technology, that's very niche. Um, but there really are no PhDs in habit forming technology. They don't really exist, right? There are no world experts in that. Well, guess what? If you sit down and you think about it and write about it and research and digest it and really plow into it and talk to the right people and uh, read all the other literature from related fields, you can kind of become your own PhD. It's all out there. And right. you can become the world's expert in whatever esoteric little field is interesting to you because nobody else is looking into it. <laughs> yeah, which is really interesting, right? So, so uh, and again, I, and, and so th there's this concept of planting your flag, right? I'm gonna own this bit of domain expertise, like you're saying, right? And a lot of the questions that I'm getting these days is, well, look, I mean, everything's been written, everything's been said, everything's been done. How does my, how does my, uh, you know. what, what, what can I talk about, right? What, what can I say yeah. that has not already been said? And yeah. I think what you're pointing out is, is amazing, right? You've, if, if, you've, if you've been, part, you've had an experience, you've been immersed in some kind of the work, some kind of work, right? If you can look at the trends that are happening in the marketplace and then start to kind of carve out a niche that combines those things, you can plant a unique flag like, like you've done, like habit forming technology, for example. Yeah, but I, I would also say get a day job. Um, like if, if job, you yeah. want, yeah, get a day job because, um, what really should, so here's the thing in order to know what to be a domain expert in, you have to get domain expertise. Well, how yeah. do you get domain expertise? You spend a lot of time in a domain. Well, how do you do that? You need something to drive you to get past that hump of having to catch up with the experts. And that just takes time. It takes time to read what others have written, to debate things in your own mind, to know the flaws of the way you see the world so that you can see it more clearly. Therefore, you can explain it to others. So don't rush. You know, the, the rule that I always use for my own writing is to follow my curiosity. That's kind of my mantra. When things are hard, I don't really feel like writing about something and it's difficult and uh, you know I, I'm getting uh, agitated or bored by what I'm writing and I just want to do something else for a bit. Always looking for the curiosity, looking for the spark of you know what do I want to know, then that can sustain you. So you know if you can keep your day job and then do whatever it is that you want to go really deep on on nights and weekends yeah. and share that with the world, right? If you blog every week about a topic, for two years, right? Like if you write a thousand words about whatever is interesting to you, right? Whatever, whatever you think, not, not to teach others, but to teach yourself, right? Start every blog post with a question, how to such and such, why is such and such, right? Whatever intriguing you. But if you can stay on that topic for just one year, 52 weeks of the year, a thousand words a week, 52,000 words, that's a book. You yeah, just yeah. wrote a book, two yeah. books. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. But, but very few people can keep with a consistency because they don't follow their curiosity. They put expectations of themselves. Of, well, how do I become a bestseller? How do I get clients? How do I make a bunch of money? Yeah. Don't do that. D d you know, d follow your passion, follow the curiosity that, of, of the question you want answered. In, in the first of these, that's excellent advice, by the way. In, 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 and it made me remember, remember um, before, before we hit record, we were talking about the white snake guitar player, Joe Hoekstra, who I interviewed for one of these as well. And sorry, in that interview, he says, uh, he says, in order to be a guitar player, you have to play guitar. And it, oh my gosh, yeah. And you can be like, replace the writer stupid. with, uh, you have to write. It's, it's exactly true. I mean, so many people want to have written a book. Right. But 
almost nobody wants to write the book. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And I, and I thought, like, at first I was like, that's dumb. And I was like, no, that's not dumb. That's profound, right? Like, oh, like, it's super profound. Right? You, got, you, got to do, you got to do the work, right? Like you said, like, you've got to immerse yourself in the domain. Um, so cool. Not to belabor it because I want to move on to the next topic, but really quick. So a couple years to get the blogging done. So uh, kind of four years to, till Hooked is published, right? From kind of when you sold your company, roughly? Uh, about two years. Two years. Okay. And, uh, and, then, and then from there, um, it gets picked up how soon after? Uh, after uh, about, uh, only about like four months, I guess three or four months. Nice. It was purchased. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, from what I hear, this might be a rumor, but the rumor is that uh, basically, so you know how Amazon uh, uh, will... Um, uh, do the recommend recommended books, right? Yeah. So if you like this, you'll like that. Yeah. Uh, and apparently, again, this is just rumor. Uh, the rumor is that that if you can get a hundred reviews, it doesn't matter good or bad. If you can get just a hundred reviews, now that trips the algorithm to start recommending you to other people. So now you start getting free advertising. But only about one percent of books on Amazon ever get more than a hundred reviews. The vast majority of books never get a hundred reviews. So if you can be that 1% of books that gets 100 reviews, and I didn't know this at the beginning, but yeah. that suddenly, some reason, that, that tripping point, now, it happened to be that people really liked Hooked, and the right. reviews were very good, um, but as you said earlier, it became, it became a de-risked uh, property, right? It's like, it's like if you want to start a business, if there's great cash flow, then you're happy to invest. It's when it's risky that you don't want to invest. So when my agent, uh, first of all, my agent called me up, which, you know, I didn't call them. That's the hardest part about publishing, getting a book pub professionally published is finding an agent. I but know. she called me, I didn't call her. <laughs> and then when she went out to sell the book, I never wrote a book proposal. She just opened up the Amazon page and say, look, people love this book. How much more would they love it if you professionally published it and made it look like a real, you know, like, uh, like a, uh, a book published by a random house versus one that's, that was self-published. And uh, yeah, that's 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 all it took amazing amazing and yeah i i have felt that pain of finding the the publishing agent and uh <laughs> and then fight and i wrote i had to write the proposal um so i i, I know that pain as well um so look one of the and, and, and this is coming across clearly in this conversation so uh which is which is fantastic but i want i want to call out a couple things there's some qualities that have helped you become forever employable and, and the qualities again that we talk about in the book entrepreneurialism obviously self-confidence, reinvention, that type of thing. I want to talk about self-confidence. I want to talk about self-confidence specifically because A, my perception of you, and we're just getting to know each other over these last couple of months, um, is that you don't lack for it, um, which, is, <laughs> which, which is interesting. I, I don't feel that I like for it either too much. But whenever I talk to audiences about this topic, I do always do a poll about the five qualities of being forever employable, self-confidence being one of them. It's always the tiniest one. People go like, no, I don't have any of that. Like I have, uh, I, I'd love to keep learning. I'd love to keep improving. I might even have a little entrepreneurial spirit. Most people don't admit to that. But self-confidence, it's almost 0%. Like it, it, it doesn't matter how many people are on on a, on a webinar or a call. And so uh, I would love if you, if you could share a story um, from your past that has helped you develop your self-confidence to the point where you're like, hey, I can write a book. Hey, I can get up on stage and talk to a couple thousand people. You know, yeah. uh, where, does that come, where did that come from for you? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I took a, a really wonderful class in, uh, in college uh, about jazz. And I don't, I didn't, I didn't like jazz. I, I still don't actually really like jazz, but <laughs> I mean, I, I like it. I appreciate it, but it's not like I wouldn't come home and actually, no, that's not true. Sometimes I write to jazz, but anyway, I'm not a jazz and aficionado, but I right. took this amazing class and what I learned in the class. So we had this wonderful professor who was a jazz aficionado and um, he, one of the first lessons that we learned was that he taught us about how jazz is really the intersection of, of, of African uh, beats and, 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 and African influence with European instruments mm -hmm. and how it's that blending of old creates something new. 
And I, I always remember that when I thought to myself, like, who the heck, heck am I? Like, what, what do I have to offer that hasn't already been said? I always tell myself it's just jazz. <laughs> that whatever it is, even if I'm taking 90% old stuff, the 10% of weaving in what's in me and unique only to my life experience is, is going to make jazz. It's going to make something brand new. And so that to me is how I, how I give myself the permission to say things publicly uh, that, you know, when I don't feel self-confident, when I'm not sure about, well, has this already been said? I, I say to myself, well, that's okay if it's already been said. Uh, right. You know, the, the instruments that made jazz were around for a very long time, but they weren't played the same way. And so that's the same way with writing. You can say essentially the same lesson, right? Many of these lessons, there's nothing new under the sun, right? <laughs> like right. There's, there's, there's very few things that are really, really profoundly new in the world, but there's a, a huge appetite for people to get the same message in a slightly different way, right? Yeah. It's said from a different point of view. And so that I think has always given me uh, the, the confidence to say things with my unique voice. Amazing, amazing. It, it, it's interesting. Like, there's, uh, that's, that's super interesting to hear. And, and uh, it, it's a jazz um, reference I, I haven't heard before, which is great because I've, I've, I've used jazz in my work as well. You hear jazz used as, as, um, as a metaphor for collaboration techniques and that type of thing. But as a, as a kind of at, at the root, like the makeup of it, the fundamental makeup of it as kind of inspiration for allowing yourself to, to, reinvent not reinvent but deliver things that have been around a long a long time yeah focus or a slightly new twist or a slightly different perspective that is uniquely yours because you're the only one who's had that experience with that right. stuff right right like jazz could not have started in africa jazz had to start in america right because it was the right. intersection of of these various backgrounds just like there's the intersection of you know old ideas with your new experience creates something very unique. Um, I will say too that the time to be most self-confident is when you in fact lack it most when you're getting started. Mm. That I think a lot of people who are just getting started and ask the sort of questions that you're asked around like, well, what do I write about? And how do I know that the, there's market demand and all that stuff. The beauty of, of starting out is that nobody's reading your crap. <laughs> right? Like I look back at my early articles they're horrible. The early blog posts are terrible. They are so bad. I would never have published them now, knowing what I know now. But back then, nobody was reading. And so I didn't care if it sucked. I didn't know it sucked. But the fact that like now I do care, right? Like it's right. when you get more experience that you actually should be more self-confidence because now you have people to disappoint. If you're right. just getting started, right write about anything, right? Just write about something that interests you. Uh, nobody's reading anyway. Right, right, yeah. Uh, that's, that's really, really good advice, right? It might, you might as well try a bunch of stuff and, then see, and see what sticks. Um, cool, look, I've got one more question for you and then, and then um, we'll finish up here. Uh, this has been tremendous, like so much tactical, practical advice, which, is, which I love and, and like, I pride myself on as well. Let's get, let's put some stuff out there that people can actually take action on. So thank you for this. Um, so one kind of final question here. Um, so uh, the pandemic has shut down the world. Um, we're slowly starting to reopen a little bit. Um, you are based in New York City. You saw the writing on the wall that was happening there. Um, and you picked up your family and moved to Singapore. Right, really, it's just kind of the other side of the world Tem temporarily. Right, you're not you're not there for for forever. At least at least that's what I understand to be the current plan. Um, and so, how are you able to do that? Right. So when we talk we talk about building these kind of uh, these opportunity magnets. Right. So this 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 forever employable platform where you are the domain expert, and clearly you're the domain expert on 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 a, on a series of topics at this point. How are you able to kind of pick up your life and move it to the other side of the world and continue working? Yeah, I mean, that, that is uh, one of the, the great luxuries of being forever employable is that with this kind of model that, that, that you describe, um, you aren't tied down. I mean, when, when this pandemic hit, um, we've been homeschooling my daughter. I have an 11-year-old little girl here. And uh, we've been homeschooling her for about five years, and I've been working from home for 
uh, I guess, eight years or so. So it's, it was nothing new for us. Uh, you know, so only our rooms changed, but essentially our day-to-day -day life hasn't changed. Um, and, and to me, that's always been a tremendous luxury. I mean, I'm, uh, that's, it's not everyone's personality. I think a lot of people really like having a boss and an office and they kind of miss that for me. Like I, I, I live in ideas, right? I, I love having time to think and digest and process and research and write. Like I really love that and really value the ability to decide what I will do with my time. Um, so the, 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 the benefit of that is that like, well, let me tell you this. I, my first job out of college, uh, I was a consultant at the Boston Consulting Group, which is a very high pressure, always on type culture. Now they've gotten a lot better, but back then in 2001, uh, it was a very, very difficult work environment. And I always remember Monday mornings feeling so crappy. <laughs> I didn't want to go to work. I hated it. I mean, to go work for, uh, you know, to go to have to be at this spot at this time. It, it, to me, it felt like being a slave. I just hated it. And uh, I, I made a transition from like corporate life, which I very quickly learned wasn't for, for me, to starting my own business as an entrepreneur. But then I also felt super tied down. Uh, entrepreneurship is not all it's cracked up to be. Your boss is just your customers and your employees. Now you have obligations. You still have to go to work Monday morning. <laughs> and I, I still have that case of the Mondays. Uh, and today, because I'm forever employable, um, I, 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 I love Mondays, right? I can't wait to get yeah. back to work. Uh, and, and, and so I think that's, that's to me, uh, more valuable than money is, is freedom. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Um, thank you. That was fantastic. Um, I think you shared a tremendous amount of wealth of, of uh, actionable bits of information. And uh, I really appreciate you spending the time with me and, and sharing your story with us, Nir. Thanks so much. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you so much for